of AWS Public Sector Summit here in person in Washington, D.C. for two days live, finally a real event. I'm John Furrier, your host of theCUBE. We've got a great guest, Howard Levinson from Databricks, Regional Vice President and General Manager of the Federal Team for Databricks. Uh, super unicorn, is it a decacorn yet? It's uh, not yet public, but welcome I, to theCUBE. I don't know what the next stage <laughs> after unicorn is, but <laughs> we're growing rapidly. Thank uh, you, John. Our audience knows Databricks uh, extremely well. Ollie's been on theCUBE many times. Even back, we were covering them back when big data was big data. Now it's all data, everything. So we watched your success, congratulations. Thank you. Um, so there's no, you know, not a big bridge for us to cross to see you here at AWS Public Sector Summit. Tell us what's going on inside the Databricks Amazon relationship. Yeah, it's, uh, it's been a great relationship. You know, when the company got started some number of years ago, we got a contract with the government to deliver uh, the Databricks capability in their classified cloud, in Amazon's classified cloud. So that was the start of a great federal relationship. Today, virtually all of our business is in AWS, and we run in every single AWS environment from commercial cloud to gov cloud to secret to top secret environments, and uh, we've got customers doing uh, great things and experiencing great results from Databricks and Amazon. The federal government's um, the classic, I call migration opportunity, right? Because, I mean, let's face it, before the pandemic, even five years ago, even 10 years ago, glacier moving speed, slow, slow, then they had to get modernized with the pandemic, forced really to do it. Yeah. But you guys have already cleared the runway with your value proposition. You've got Lake House now. You guys are really optimized for the cloud, okay? We, Hardcore. Yeah, we are. We only run in the cloud and we take advantage of every single go fast feature that Amazon gives us. But you know, John, it's the uh, Office of Management and Budget did a study a couple of years ago. I think there were 28,000 federal data centers 28,000 federal data centers. Think about that for a minute. And just think about, like, let's say in each one of those data centers, you've got a handful of operational data stores, of databases. The federal government is trying to take all of that data and make sense out of it. The first step to making sense out of it is bringing it all together, normalizing it, federating it, and that's exactly what we do. And uh, that's been a real win for our federal clients and, and it's been a real exciting uh, opportunity to watch people uh, succeed in that endeavor. All right, we had another guest on and she said, those data center huggers, AKA tree huggers, data center huggers, you know, pejorative term, uh, people won't let go. Yeah. So, but they're slowly, you know, dying away and moving on to the cloud. So migration is huge. How are you guys migrating with your customers? Give us an example of how it's working. What are some of the use cases? Yeah, so before I do that, I want to tell you a quick story. I've uh, had the luxury of working with the Air Force Chief Data Officer, Eileen Vadreen. And she is uh, commonly quoted as saying, just remember, as, air, as airmen, it's not your data. It's the Air Force's data. So people were data center huggers, now they're data huggers. Yeah. But all of that data belongs to the government at the end of the day. So how do we help in that? Well, think about all this data sitting in all these operational data stores, they're getting, it's getting updated all the time, but you want to be able to federate this data together and make some sense out of it. So for like an organization like uh, US Citizenship and Immigration Services, they had, I think, 28 different data sources. And they want to be able to pull that data basically in real time and bring it into a data lake. Well, that means doing a change data capture off of those operational data stores, transforming that data and normalizing it so that you can then enjoin it. And we've done that, I think they're now up to 70 data sources that are continually ingested into their data lake. And from there, they support thousands of users doing analysis and reports for the whole visa processing system for the United States, the whole naturalization environment, and their uh, efficiency has gone up, I think by their metrics, by 24X. Yeah, I mean, Sandy Carter was just on the queue earlier. She's the vice president of the partner ecosystem here at public sector. And I was commenting to her that federal game has changed. It used to be hard to get into, you had to know everybody, and you navigate the trip wires and all the subtle hints and, and, and the people who are friends, and, and it was like cloak and dagger. And so people were locked in on certain things. Yeah. Databases and data is now has to be freely available. I know one of the things that you guys are passionate about, and this is kind of hardcore architectural thing, is that you need horizontally scalable data yeah. to really make AI work, right? Machine yeah. learning works when you have data. Yeah. How far along are these guys in their thinking? When you talk about customers, because we're seeing progress. 
How far along are we? Yeah, we still have a long way to go in the federal government. I mean, I tell everybody, I think the federal government's probably four or five years behind what Databricks top uh, uh, clients are doing, but there are uh, clearly people in the federal government that have uh, really ramped it up and are on a par or even exceeding some of the commercial clients. Uh, USCIS, CBP, FBI are some of the clients that we work with that are pretty far ahead. And I'll say, I mentioned a lot about the operational data stores, but there's all kinds of data that's coming in. At USCIS, they do these naturalization interviews. Those are captured in real text. So now you want to do natural language processing against them, make sure these interviews are of the highest quality control. We want to be able to predict which people are going to show up for interviews based on their geospatial location and the day of the week and other factors, uh, the weather perhaps. So they're using all of these data types, yeah. uh, imagery, uh, text, and structured data all in the lake house concept to make predictions about uh, how they should run their business. You know, that's a really good point. I was talking with uh, Keith Brooks earlier, he's director of business development, go to market strategy for AWS public sector. He's been there from the beginning, this is the 10th year of GovCloud, right? Mm -hmm. So we were kind of riffing, but the JPL, NASA JPL, they did production workloads out of the gate, yeah. full mission. So now fast forward today, cloud native really is available. So like, how do you see the, um, the, the agencies and the government handling Okay, replatforming, I get that. But now to do the refactoring where you guys have the lake house, new things can happen with cloud native technologies. What's the, what's the, what's the crossover point for that point? Yeah, I think our lake house architecture is really a, a big uh, breakthrough architecture. It used to be people would take all of this data, they'd put it in a Hadoop data lake, they'd end up with a data swamp uh, with really not good control or good data quality. And uh, then they would take the data from the data swamp or the data lake and they'd curate it and go through an ETL process and put a second copy into their uh, data warehouse. So now you had two copies of the data, two governance models, maybe two versions of the data, a lot to manage, a lot to control. With our lake house architecture, you can put all of that data in the data lake. It, it, with our delta format, it comes in a curated way uh, there's a, a catalog associated with the data so you know what you've got. And now you can literally build an ephemeral data warehouse directly on top of that data and it exists only for the period of time that um, uh, people need it. And so it's cloud native, it's elastically scalable, it terminates when nobody's using it. We run the whole Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services. The whole Medicaid repository for the United States runs in an ephemeral data warehouse built on Amazon S3. You know, that is a huge call out. I want to just unpack that for a second. What you just said, to me, puts an exclamation point on cloud value. Because it's not your grandfather's data warehouse. Yeah, no. It's like, okay, we do data warehouse capability, but we're using higher level cloud services, whether it's governance stuff or AI, to actually make it work at scale for those environments. I mean, that, that to me is refactoring. That's not replatforming, mm -hmm. just replatforming. That's replatforming in the cloud and then refactoring capability for un, uh, new advantages. It's really true, and now, you know, at CMS, they have one copy of the data, so they do all of their reporting, they've got a lot of congressional reports that they need to do, but now they're leveraging that same data, not making a copy of it, yeah. for uh, the Center for Program Integrity for fraud. And we know how many billions of dollars worth of fraud exist in the Medicaid system. Yeah. And now we're applying artificial intelligence and machine learning on entity analytics to really get to yeah. the root of those problems. It's a game changer. Yeah, and this is where the efficiency comes in at scale because you start to see, I mean, we always talk on theCUBE about like how software's changed. The old days, you put it on the shelf, shelfware they called it. Yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> that's our generation. Yeah. And now you got the cloud. You didn't know if something was hot or not until the inventory is like, we didn't sell through. In the cloud, if you're not performing, it's you're, you suck basically. So it's, it's not working. It's so really it's true. an instant report card. So now when you go to the cloud, and you think the data lake and uh, data lake house, what you guys do, uh, and others like Snowflake, and we're, who are optimized in the cloud, you can't deny it. And then when you compare it to like, okay, so I'm saving you millions and millions if you just on one thing. Never mind the top line opportunities. So, so John, you, you know. Years ago, people didn't believe the cloud was going to be what it is. Like, pretty much today, the cloud's inevitable. It's yeah. everywhere. I'm going to make you another prediction. Go ahead. 
Um, and you can say you heard it here first. The data warehouse is going away. The lake house is clearly going to replace it. There's no need anymore for two separate copies. There's no need for a proprietary uh, storage copy of your data. And people want to be able to apply more than SQL to the data uh, and a data warehouses just restrict. But what restrict about an it. ocean house? Yeah, the lake is kind of small when you think about it. Unless it's Lake Michigan, it's pretty big. No, I think, oh. it's, I think it's going to go bigger than that. I think we're talking about sky computing. We've been at cloud computing. Oh, that's a, okay. We're going to, and, and we're going to do that because people aren't going to put all of their data in one place. Yeah. They're going to have it spread across different Amazon regions or, yeah, yeah. or, or Amazon availability zones, and you're going to want to share data. And yeah. you know, we just introduced this delta sharing capability. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it allows you to share data without a sharing server uh, directly from picking up the, basically the Amazon URLs and sharing them with or different organizations. So you're sharing in place, the data actually isn't moving. You've got great governance and great granularity of the data that you choose to share. And data sharing is going to be the next, uh, yeah. next breakthrough. I, you know, I really love the lake house where we're seeing data where I totally see that. So I totally would align with that and say, I'd bet with you on that one. The Skynet, Skynet, the sky computing. See, you're taking it away, man. I know, Skynet, <laughs> I got it. Anything to do with computing in the sky is Skynet, that's Terminator. So, but that's real. I mean, I think that's a concept where it's like, you know, what serverless and functions does for yeah. servers, you're doing it for data. Yeah. You got to be able to connect data. Nobody lives yeah. in an island. You got to be able to connect data. And more data, we all know, more data produces better results. So how do you get more data? You connect to more data sources. Well Howard, great to have you on. Talk about the relationship real quick as we end up here with Amazon. What are you guys doing together? How's the partnership? Yeah, I mean the partnership with Amazon is amazing. We have, uh, we work, uh, I think probably 95% of our federal business is uh, running in Amazon's cloud today. As I mentioned, John, we run across uh, AWS commercial, AWS GovCloud, uh, secret environment, C2S. And um, you know we have better integration with Amazon services than I'll say some of the Amazon services. If people want to integrate with Glue or Kinesis or SageMaker or Redshift, we have complete integration with all of those. And that's really, it's not just a partnership at the sales level, yeah. it's a partnership and uh, integration at the engineering level. Well I think I'm really impressed with you guys as a company. I think you're an example of the kind of business model that people might have been afraid of, which is, being in the cloud, you can have a moat, you have competitive advantage, you can build uh, intellectual property. And, and John, don't forget, it's all based on open source, open data. Yeah. Like almost everything that we've done, we've made yeah. available to people. We get 30 million downloads of the Databricks technology just for people that want to use it for free. So yeah. no vendor lock-in, I think that's really important to yeah. most of our federal clients and to yeah. everybody. Yeah, I've always said competitive advantage, scale and choice, right? Yeah. That's what Databricks. Yeah. Great. Howard, thanks for coming on theCUBE, appreciate it. Thanks again, All right. John. CUBE coverage here in Washington for a face-to-face -face physical event. We're on the ground, of course. We're also streaming it digital for the hybrid event. This is the CUBE's coverage of AWS Public Sector Summit. We'll be right back after this short break.